Welcome back to Cross-Cultural Communication and Management. This is Topic 1 of the Lecture on Stereotype and Bias Management. There are three topics in this lecture. In this lecture, we will discuss the critical topic of stereotype, prejudice, and bias. In Topic 1, we will understand from the evolutionary point of view, why these phenomena exist. In Topic 2, we will look at the consequences, and Topic 3 will introduce us to some strategies to deal with them. First, let's have a recap of what we have learned so far. We have learned, that while animals rely on genes for life guidance, humans rely on culture. Culture is an immense resource. For those who work internationally, being cultural competent means the ability of adapting to, and creating a culture. The tree of culture has three layers. The fundamental concerns at the trunk, representing building blocks of culture, such as religion, art, music, and hierarchy. The values at the branches, means asking, how important are these concerns? High or moderate? The outward expressions at the canopy, are specific objects, symbols, and behaviors of these concerns and values. A big part of the outward expression is nonverbal communication, such as the use of time, space and body language. We all need nonverbal communication to survive, but rely on them at high or low level. Because culture is resource, is faster, richer, and more dynamic than genes, this incredible diversity we see in culture, comes from the interaction of culture with four drivers, the environment, genes, brain, and behaviors. This dynamics happens at all three levels, universal level where we are all the same, collective level where we have different national, organizational or group culture, and at the individual level, where each of us is a unique and dynamic person. Because of this dynamics, we should take specific context into account when communicating across different cultures and individuals. This lesson will focus on these two layers, individual and collective level. How do we navigate this? What happens if we connect these two levels of individual and collective and misuse them? For example, how do you feel if someone starts at the individual level and tells you, you are German, you are supposed to be a good planner, then justifies it by moving to the collective level? Isn't it true that the Germans are good with organizing? Stereotype could be understood by knowing one important characteristic of our brain. It wants routine and pattern to save time, energy, and predict the future. Routine save energy so the brain can spare resource for other tasks. That is why much of our everyday activity should be automatic and turn into a habit. In this study, the author shows us that, for habitual behaviors, the striatum, often associated with reward, is linked with the sensory motor cortex. This optimizes automatic execution. To compare, for goal-directed behaviors, the striatum is linked with the prefrontal cortex, which is the head office of cognitive thinking, emotional procession, and decision-making. This is associated with calculated execution. So the brain wants routine to save energy. In the same vein, it also wants patterns to save times and to predict the future. Here is a way to look at it. Can you please tell me what you see? Some of you may say, three dots. For some others, it is a triangle that you see. What happens here is that, the brain automatically connects the dots, and gives us a big picture, a pattern that makes sense. Long time ago, life on the savanna demanded quick decision making. For our ancestors, if they are in the forest, among the high grass, and there is a rattle in the bush, their brain would connect these dots together, and tell them there could be a predator. In other words, this pattern means danger. The decision of fight or flight comes quick, without thinking. They could be wrong most of the time, that there is no predator, but better safe than sorry. The brain, therefore, is a pattern-making machine, and that is meant for our own survival. Here are a few more examples. We look at the cloud and trying to make a pattern, or a triangle out of it. This could be a whale, or a ship. We look at the picture of Mars, and see a human face. We connect dots such as, Friday, 
the 13th, and black cat. All together let us make a bad day pattern. This explains conspiracies as well. Flat earthers, for example, are people who collect all the information, or the dots, to fit the pattern, so the triangle, of how NASA has lied to all of us, making us think the earth is round, while in fact, it is flat. When we do this to people, then instead of a triangle pattern, we have stereotype. But the patterns in the modern time are much more complex. The three dots could be, young, black, and wearing a hoodie. And the triangle pattern emerged is, troublemaker. This seems to be case with a boy in the U.S. by the name of Trayvon Martin. He was shot dead, by a community guard. The description given to the police, before the shooting was, he was wearing a dark, gray hoodie. And the guard thought he was up to no good, on drug, or something. The hoodie became a rally point, for many black people, to speak out on racism, especially how nonverbal behaviors have become automatic patterns for quick judgment. This is one of those voices, a project by artist Williams. He pictured 56 black men in hoodies. They are politicians, engineers, or teachers. The message is, for every black man you see represented doing something negative, there are 56 of us that aren't. In everyday life, we stereotype quickly, making patterns that are both right and wrong. To save time, energy, and to predict the future. Someone who is quiet, sits at the back, and speaks softly, fit into the pattern of people who are incompetent. It is here that values play out. Because the same pattern, can also mean competence for those who embrace high context dependence, calmness, caution, having a big picture, thinking and doing with care. That is to say, stereotypes can be positive as well. A male, young, Asian, would be good at math. When I joined an international summer camp, some of my classmates thought because I am Asian, I definitely knows martial art. Very often, the dot can be just one simple stimuli, and the whole pattern emerges. For example, being Dutch goes along with being tall, eating cheese, riding a bike, or even smoking weed. Sometimes, stereotypes can be supported by research, as we see in the static paradigm, where each country has a score on a certain value. So for example, being Dutch would mean, individualistic, less likely to accept hierarchy, direct, or low-context dependent, and probably holding quite feminine values, such as a strong emphasis on education, quality of life, consensus, and tolerance. Of course, there is some truth in here. And if you want to confirm these sophisticated stereotypes, you can always look for other dots that fit the pattern. And naturally, ignore the dots that don't. Here is an example. I remember a discussion among my Dutch friends. One of them said, the Dutch is often known for tolerance. After all, the country is among the first to legalize gay marriage, to tolerate sex work, as well as recreational smoking of marijuana. Then another person disagreed, pointing to the apartheid regime in South Africa. To argue back, the first person recited the Dutch national anthem. It glorifies a leader of German blood, who forever honors the Spanish king, and somehow, still is loyal to the fatherland, until he dies. That, is the ultimate level of tolerance. So the argument went on, and on. Everyone was so good at finding the dots that fit her, or his own triangle. Or, using the terms in our previous lecture, we find outward expressions that fit the value we believe in. We only see what we want to see. Needless to say that on that day, we had a good laugh, and a very noisy debate. Generally, we stereotype in two ways. First, we apply individual information to create a pattern or an oversimplified idea about the collective in order to save time and energy in giving judgment. For example, some Muslims are terrorists and people may create a pattern of Muslims are terrorists. Media often gives us both patterns and the dots to make patterns. 
Again, we can always select those dots that fit our existing stereotypes. I speak this from my own experience as a former journalist. During the Arab Spring, I wrote this article when I was in Syria. It was published in an Israeli newspaper. For many of Israelis who are new to this conflict, my personal views became their big picture or the pattern of the war in this country. With social media, now everyone can have a power of a journalist, but bears no responsibility of a journalist with fact checking and objectivity. This kind of media is giving us the wrong patterns increasingly. The second way we stereotype is by applying the collective norms to unique individuals. This way, we use the existing pattern to predict the future. For example, we have a big Chinese population in the world, and this creates an oversimplified pattern that that every single Asian face is a Chinese face. I have been greeted, ni hao, countless time. There are people who, before I could even say a word, would tell me how much they loved Chinese takeaways. But things are not funny anymore. When this season greeting, Happy Chinese New Year, is applied to many of my Korean, Japanese, Singaporean, Taiwanese, and Vietnamese friends, myself included. The argument is, Asians are Chinese anyway. A colleague of mine even quietly stopped helping a client after his company sent out the wholesale inappropriate season greeting. In the context of the pandemic, many Asians suffered from discrimination. When a collective pattern is applied to specific individuals, once, when I walked into the train, a woman looked at me and whispered with suspicion, "Chinese." So I whispered back, "Italian." I'm obviously guilty of using one stereotype to respond to another, but you know what I mean. Let's move on to prejudice. Here is again a slide from our previous lecture on nonverbal communication. Because in the past, knowing quickly who are friends and enemies is a matter of life or death, the brain has evolved to decide who is in group and out group extremely quickly, based on nonverbal cues such as skin color, gender, language, or even clothes. It takes only one tenth of a second for the brain to make a trust decision. The brain, when seeing in group people, Activates quite differently from seeing out group. This in group bias is automatic, built in for survival. So the brain wants to turn dots into patterns to save energy, time, and predict future. It also wants certainty to keep us alive. That's why it drives us toward similarities, which could mean reward, and away from differences, which could mean threat. Because similarities signal in group and differences signal out group, the brain pulls us towards in group. And away from outgroup. In fact, we can love our in-group so much that when we see them winning, we feel as if if we are winning as well. In this brain scan, the purple area represents neural activity of self-win. When seeing those who are similar to them winning, the participants in this study also had an increase of activity in the same reward center. We are drawn towards the similarities of in-group because it reaffirms our own ego that we are good. Even when other groups mean no harm, and we are drawn towards the familiarity of in-group because it means safety, even when what is familiar is bad for us. This explains why some people stay in a toxic relationship or a toxic working environment. Here is another interesting study: soccer fans observed people suffering from pain. They felt more pain and empathy when their own team suffered from it. They were even willing to share the pain. So the help condition on this graph, and suffer from it themselves to rescue their in-group members. Prejudice is the consequence of this bias. We can love our in-group so much that we end up disliking other groups. Stereotype is an oversimplified pattern about a group and can be neutral or both negative and positive. Prejudice pushes it further by having a negative attitude towards an out-group. We have plenty of such prejudices. Jews are greedy. Immigrants are stealing our jobs. Men are cheaters. Bankers are untrustworthy, or Africans are lazy.
To conclude, stereotype is an oversimplified idea about people. It is a survival mechanism. It helps us to make patterns out of loose information. This way, we can gain control of the situation, saving energy, time, and predict the future pattern. We often stereotype in two ways. One is applying individual to collective level. For example, some white people are racist, so white people are racist. Another way is to apply collective to individual level. For example, most men are the breadwinner. You are a man, so you have to be the breadwinner of the family. While stereotype is an oversimplified pattern and can be negative, positive, or neutral, prejudice is always negative. This is rooted in the way humans have evolved to love and trust our in-group automatically. This discrimination process is built in for survival. The problem is, we can love our in-group so much that it results in a negative bias towards others. 